sets and relations. Mm. I don't I realize that's a word I never say. Uh, <laughs> How do you go to control L? Control L. First of all, it's a thing that I should write in the form. that are believed to exist that was very popular in past centuries where people didn't have a lot of information about what actually exists or not. In this specific case, it's because uh, there are a lot of features of RHEL that are believed to be true or false, and when you look at them a bit more carefully, it turns out that they are actually false or true, I guess. Um, so that's what a best theory sort of looks like. They were really pretty and golden, I guess. This is the Aberdeen one, the credit goes to them. And I'll have a monster for each single, uh, like Greek mythological monsters usually, for each of the sections. So that should make this lighter than yesterday's presentation. So first of all, pure state point mechanics in a frown. Uh, it does look like a hill, but there's actually something fishy going on, which gets slightly clearer towards the end of the section. Uh, objects are finite sets, morphisms are relations. There is a non Cartesian symmetric nodal structure, even though the tensor is called the Cartesian tensor. Um, the states are, correspond to the subsets of each single set, and the dagger is given by just inverting the relations, so swapping pairs, inputs and outputs. Now it has a superposition operation, so it is enriched over finite commutative monoids, but it's not enriched over finite commutative groups. So that's the first difference, but as of now it doesn't seem to make, uh, to make it terrible to work with. And the scalars form a semi-ring, which makes it suitable for analysis in appropriate uh, contextual frameworks. So that's a good start. We have a categorization of classical structures by Shupavovich, and it's done in terms of abelian groupoids. So you can think of an abelian groupoids as a partition of the set into uh, subsets G lambda, which are disjoint and uh, their, their union forms the entire set, which come with a group, an abelian group structure on each. Or you can think of a groupoid as having multiplication, which is like a group multiplication, but it's actually a partial function. And it is only defined when the two elements you're trying to multiply belong to the same group in the groupoid. And that partial function will give the multiplication of the classical structure and the set of the units, so all the zeros of all the abelian groups, will give you the unit of the classical structure. So that's quite a neat characterization. And the classical points are conveniently exactly the groups that form the group point. Because if you try to multiply elements from them, you just get zero, unless you're multiplying elements from the same one where you get the entire group again. So they behave like classical points. They're meshed and then obviously they're also uh, duplicated. Now in Hill, you can embed all partial functions by picking classical structures on your domain and codomain and representing them as pure maps with respect to those classical structures and their classical states. And you can do a similar thing in RHEL, you just fix two, well, abelian groupoids, i.e. partial structures. Uh, sorry, uh, classical structures, and you define this map which tests against the classical points and then returns the appropriate classically computed classical point of the other structure. Now in Hill, this process is one-to-one. -one. Once you fix a classical structure on the main and one on the codomain, there is a unique 
classical morphism that corresponds to any partial function. In rel, that is not true. You have quite a lot of room for maneuver, and it comes from the fact that you can just use the automorphisms of your of the groups in the abelian groupoid, and they will not really change anything because when you test against the entire group, you will obtain the entire group at the end, and you will not be able to distinguish two functions that are adding up to one of these automorphisms. Now, this is a consequence of the fact that most classical structures don't actually have enough classical points. There's only one, in fact, that does. And it can be interpreted as microscopic degrees of freedom if you take the groupoid framework of uh, Christoph and Jim. So, as promised, there is one structure which, is, which has enough classical points, which is the discrete structure that just duplicates. It's the diagonal as the diagonal is its co-multiplication and uh, unique total function from x to the uh, one point set as its co-unit. There is a unique structure defined by this and it, it corresponds to the discrete groupoid where all groups are just trivial and it has a singleton as its classical points as a consequence. It's the only one with enough classical points and it gives the usual embedding. So you can think of the embedding of partial functions into relations as the embedding of partial functions into relation with respect to the discrete structures. That's a more general way of seeing it. And it corresponds better to the intuition that in Hill you can fix structures on both spaces. Now finally, before we move to CPM, a brief note about isometries and unitaries. Now, in FREL, Isometries take a very particular form. They are in the they are embeddings of total injections where the structure on the domain has to be the discrete structure. So they are in that form, but they force the discrete structure on the domain, which means that they are a lot more restrictive than in F Hill, where you could pick any structure on the domain and you could still define isometries as classical functions from them. The consequence of this is that unitaries are just projections. So there are no non-trivial embeddings of unitaries in there. There is no trivial um, unitary that is not actually a classical bijection with respect to the discrete structures. Even though you can embed bijections with respect to other structures and then you get other maps. But that's, that doesn't give you a unitary. So this is the start. It looks kind of like F. Hill in the beginning and then it is a bit more restrictive than F Hill uh, on one side, on the isometry side, and a bit more lax than F Hill on the classical points side. So CPM, uh, well, the coherence is kind of horrible in CPM, it turns out. A brief reminder, it's like the maps take the usual doubled up form and the cap, the cup is given by the diagonal and the cap is the adjoint to the diagonal. Um, the discarding map as in the usual interpretation. Now we've just seen there is a graph theoretic formalism with states and morphism to correspond to subgraphs of the complete graph and composition is done by lifting and I guess a few pictures will be better than uh, a lot of words even though you've already seen many today. Uh, pure states are clicks, non-pure states are non-clicks and there are particular states that are of interest which are the discrete ones which have no edges, which will play a role in the end. Now maps are similar, they're just uh, on products. Uh, pure maps have this click property, and non-pure maps, with, there, there you go. That's the, that's the discovery map, they're not clicks in general. Composition works by just, uh, you have a graph for your state, a graph for your relation, you lift your edges and nodes, you discard the ones that are not covered, and then you project. Yeah, this was done by done 10 minutes ago, so I hope it's still clear. Um, so yeah, the important bit in here is that you can define a notion of relative purity of states by considering how many edges of difference there are between two, the, between the graphs corresponding to two states in CPM rel. And I will say that the states are related uh, if their, their subgraphs cover the same set of nodes but they have different numbers of edges. So that forms a partial order and pure states which are clicks will be the maxima of this partial order. Now this partial order looks something like this. So for example there's a pure state on the top 
and then there's you remove one edge, you remove two edges, those are the atoms of the lower set, and then there's a discrete state at the bottom of the lower set. So that's how you could think of this, and it turns out, well, obviously since it's closed under intersection, it's an atomic uh, semi-lattice, and you can think of union as convex combination of states, in fact, that's exactly what comes out of the CPM construction as an interpretation of convex combination, and you get to the conclusion, as mentioned by Dan before, that every pure state can be expressed as convex combination of non-pure states. In fact, you can always pick non-pure states which have exactly one edge and you can get any pure state as a convex combination of those. So they're not maximally discrete in this notion of purity, but they're almost maximally discrete. So that's quite disturbing, I guess. Um, but what really goes wrong is the coherence. So the coherence in Hild is can be thought of as this map, which is a well-defined causal CPM morphism if the classical, if the structure is a special uh, Duggar commutative for Venus algebra. And in Hild, it has a very handy property that if you apply it to any causal CPM state, then you obtain a probabilistic convex combination of classical points of the structure which gives the entire interpretation that the CPM construction yields a category of mixed states. Now, it also justifies the quantum classical notation because, uh, after all, if everything you do afterwards is classical in that particular structure, then it's the same as doing it on one wire or doing it duplicated because you will be doing pure maps anyway. In FREL, this fails. There is only one decoherence map, the one corresponding to the discrete structure that has that property and that returns in general a convex combination of classical points. And now you could think, well, maybe it's just that the decoherence map is the wrong way of decohering states in that sense. So it could be that in Hill it can be defined in that particularly nice graphical way, but there may be another one and it turns out that there isn't one. So unless you have the, class, the discrete structure, there is no map that is causal, preserves the classical points, and always result in complex combinations. You can't have one. So, in the case of RHEL, the CPM category cannot really be interpreted as a category of mixed states unless you do something additional to it. Which, sorry? Oh. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so you can't really interpret it as a category of mixed states natively, unless you do something more about it which we'll see in a second. So this is what the decoherence map looks like if you use if you use the graph formalism, which is really handy, because without it, it's just a mangled set with lots of elements in it. And it takes this nice, pretty form. They're not really cosets. They look like cosets in the Z2 and Z3Ks. They are a bit more than cosets. They're actually orbits of elements under the right regular action of the group. Uh, but they have, they take this form and they definitely don't form clicks. So if, if it was to map every state to a convex combination of classical states, then we would expect it to have the form of a click on the areas corresponding to the two classical points. This is the abelian group Z2 plus Z3, so this corresponds to Z2, this corresponds to Z3, and we'd expect it to be a click. It's not a click in there. It's clearly not click. It's never click, in fact. Not even for the Z2 case. The only case where it is a click is in the Z1 case. So in the discrete structure where there is no edges and you just take one node per component. And then, yes, indeed, it always returns a convex combination of the singletons, i.e. this particular decoherence has the effect of eliminating all of the edges of the graph, which comes in handy for the proof of locality. Now, this is because the discrete structure has enough classical points, and when you have enough classical points, then you can prove that the decoherence behaves exactly like that. But when you don't, and this is the case for most classical structures in FREL, then you cannot prove it, and it, indeed, this is a model where it doesn't hold. Now, somebody um, suggested yesterday that I should use the Sphinx for measurements, because you're asking questions with difficult answers. Um, so yeah, this is the high road, but a bit tricky road, I suppose, that it will take to work around the fact that you don't have convex combinations. You can say, instead of 
assuming that I get a convex combination, I will just test against classical points. Because that always forces things to be diagonal. It, this is the usual uh, scenario for the coherence. This also holds in breath. Unfortunately, testing against classical points in the case where you don't have a convex combination does not really sound very physical because you are post-selecting and you're post-selecting on a state that is not originally classical in any particular sense but perhaps more worryingly from a categorical point of view if you quotient by the equivalence relation given by states are the same if they are uh, the same when tested against states or classical states and applied to certain states then you trivialize the CPM construction you recover rel from CPM of rel so if you quotient CPM of rel by the equivalence relation that says you identify maps if they are the same when applied to a state then you don't trivialize things but if you quotient it by the relation that only considers the booleans that you obtain by testing against states and effects at the same time then you get rel again so nothing interesting happens there. Anyway, we'll take this, this road to go to the usual proof of locality where we define non-demolition measurements as usual in CPM. So they're mapped from X to X tensor Z. So Z is where the classical points live. And we ask for this map to be causal and we ask for it to be idempotent and self-adjoint. So causality forces that particular P there to be an isometry. Uh, which is quite important. And in order to get demolition measurements, since we don't have this convex combination of points, we will discard the system, as usual, and then we will test against the classical points. So we'll try that particular, we'll try the usual way of working around this issue. And what turns out is that this makes demolition measurements pretty boring. The only demolition measurement you'll ever need in this case is the decoherence. You can prove that every demolition measurement, when obtaining a framework where you test against the classical points to get its values, uh, can actually be equivalently obtained by a decoherence map following by an appropriate classical map that links the classical points. So there is nothing really interesting in demolition measurements if your measurement framework is about testing against points instead of considering what gets out of the map natively. On plus side, this makes the proof of locality easier because you only need to consider a very uh, simple class of empirical models in this case. You don't need to worry about general measurements, you just need to worry about the coherences, but the coherences are just basically testing against the, each individual classical point. So indeed, you can consider a mixed state and fix a family of classical structures which will give you the decoherence and their sets of classical points, and then you define the empirical model as the Boolean function that you get by evaluating this, that particular state rho against the different possible combinations of classical points for your classical structures. And if you define your empirical models like this, then there's a proof of locality, which originally appeared in that paper there, not in the one referenced in the uh, preprint. And you can show that every empirical model emits a local hidden variable, and if you want to construct it, you just take rho, you decohere it in the discrete structure, and then you copy it in the discrete structure, because the discrete structure always gives you complex combinations, and therefore you can copy what you get in a sensible way. Now the key points are, uh, the proof is made quite nice by this graph theoretic formulas, because all you really have to observe is that when testing against points, it doesn't really matter whether you take a pure state or the discrete state at the bottom of its lower set, because that is the testing, the boolean that you obtain is independent of the edges that you have in your graph. The edges are completely discarded. It is only dependent on the nodes that you have in your graph. So that's the key observation, and once you have that, then you can take your row, you can decohere it, uh, constructively in the discrete structure by just applying the discrete structure decoherence you get a discrete state as a result which for all intents and purposes will be measured to be the same as rho because of that property above and then you just copy it because it's a complex combination of classical points of the discrete structure can be copied and then you obtain your local hidden variable 
So these are the conclusions of this small trip through FREL. Uh, it is still a very good sandbox for variable quantum mechanics because you can apply most of the reasonings to it and at the same time a good number of times you get the wrong answer or better, the answer that you didn't expect. So it's a, it's a good stress test for the conceptual ideas. Uh, but there are serious issues with the coherence which I think invite some reflection on the quantum classical boundary and more specifically on the role of CPM as a category of mixed states. Uh, there's something more there that perhaps we should be a bit more careful about. And most importantly, if the coherence doesn't return the convex combination, then testing against classical points is not really a physically sensible thing to do. Because it is, in that sense, it becomes not very different from post-selection, in fact. So I think measurements and then the locality proof will have to be revisited in favor of a better formulas that takes into account what actually comes out of the decoherence max rather than what happens when you test that output against classical points. So I hope that was um, slightly more enlightening, I guess, on the front. And thanks for your attention. Any questions? I have a question. <laughs> so, so you can think of rel or F rel as an example of these uh, symmetric monoidal categories where the morphisms are matrices, or here matrices valued in, say, a commutative rig, where <coughs> in this particular case it's just the rig of booleans. Yes. And then on, on the other hand, finding dimensional Hilbert spaces, it's the same idea, but you're working with a rig of complex numbers. Yes. So you could ask if there's something in, bet something in between, so, you know, the booleans are like the, one of the very simplest possible rigs, so that's what part of why it's so attractive to look at, at this model, it's so simple and nice. But I was seeing that it's a little strange compared to, to finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. So I wonder if people have, have looked at um, things that are a little bit intermediate. So for example, I don't know if they would have thought about this, but there are a number of like three element commutative rigs that are worth checking out maybe. I guess people probably looked at it for finite fields and things like that. Um. So they looked, I know that in that specific paper, they have the proof of locality for every locale. So where, whenever you have uh, um, idempotent, addi uh, additively idempotent elements, uh -huh. uh, you get, basically get the same proof of locality as you get in rel. But once you start getting out of locales and into things that are more like uh, rigs, I don't really know, but I think it's interesting to look at that. There should be a general model that. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's this funny rig where you have the number 0, 1, 2, with the usual addition and multiplication, but as soon as you go over 2, you just say it's still 2. Okay, yeah, so it's, <laughs> a, it's basically it's the 0, 1, 2 chain where yeah. you take, yeah, okay. yeah. So it's not quite, a, addition not quite an item vote. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I dominated the questions. Other questions? So we look at CP star, that's the picture of CPM, these extra structures more like classical structures, but of course all the intuition needs to go out through the CPs rather so. So you mean CP star of right, rel. taking CP star of rel. Right. So you get we get we get more stuff and you get these things in quantum mechanics. You have the like classical uh, systems as well as quantum systems. Yes. But so it's a much richer algebra playground to explore this the question, yes. Uh, I, I think the issue there is that you still have a... You still interpret the classical and quantum bits by using co-multiplication and multiplication, if I remember the definition of the morphisms correctly. So you pass from the classical to the quantum by co-multiplying, then you apply a map, then you do a tracing out or discarding, and then you multiply and you get, sorry, you multiply and you go back to the classical one. And my issue, I suppose, is with that applied straight to rel is that it looks a lot like this. It looks a lot like doing this map. And while that map has a lot of meaningful 
physical sense in Hill, but I'm not entirely certain that it is as easy to translate to cases where decoherence does not work as well. So I would say that perhaps if there is a, an equivalent thing where you have that but with a decoherence map or similar properties, then yeah, that, that would make sense. Okay, let's thank you again.